This week, as we approach Remembrance Day on the 11th, we will often hear the phrase, lest we forget. The term comes from a poem by the British poet Rudyard Kipling. It was written for Queen, Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee in 1897. The British Empire was at the peak of its influence, having colonies all over the world, including in India. Today, Rudyard Kipling is known for celebrating the British Empire with its long history of oppressing people all over the world by white Britons, what he famously called in one of his books, the white man's burden. So it's not surprising that of all poets, he was asked to write a poem celebrating the queen and her empire. And yet, in this poem, he seems to at least momentarily have a change of heart about the virtues of empire. He sounds a note of caution, even of regret. The title, Recessional, is the kind of hymn that the choir sings as they're leaving the church, as the service is ending. And so to call a poem about the British Empire recessional suggests that he thinks it's on its way out. His poem reminds readers that all empires fall. And he cites biblical examples of fallen empires, Nineveh, entire. He reminds us that our power comes from God, not ourselves. When we think we have all the right answers, that's when we get into trouble. In almost every stanza, he calls on us to remember God and God's ways, lest we forget and become lost, drunk, on power and our own pride. Perhaps the reason that Kipling's phrase, lest we forget, has become associated with honoring soldiers is that wars often induce a state of forgetfulness, particularly in their early stages. It's said that one of the first casualties of war is truth. To wage war, Nations indulge in an orgy of oversimplification. Complicated issues are reduced down to slogans. Soldiers are called to hunt down beasts, not human beings. The enemy's humanity is dismissed and forgotten so they can be destroyed without any moral qualms. That impulse to forget and oversimplify has been active lately with the war in Israel-Palestine. This conflict has raised tensions here in Canada as people related to those in Israel-Palestine have, of course, taken sides, siding with the people that they know and love. And others, too, who are not directly related to anyone in the conflict have also staked out sides. As soon as the attack on Israel began, student groups and universities quickly wrote statements in support of Hamas and the Palestinians. The attack by Hamas and Israeli civilians was portrayed as justified retribution for years of oppression by the Israeli government. Student bodies all over North America wrote statements like these, including at Harvard, as well as universities here in Toronto. University administrations quickly responded by condemning these statements. At York University, the administration went so far as to shut down the student unions. This church is across the street from Glendon campus. And if you go to Glendon campus now, you'll find that the student union office is closed. It's dark. And there's some question about whether the student unions will be decertified because of this. Media outlets like the CBC have told their journalists not to use the word terrorist when describing Hamas. It's getting harder to discuss these issues freely. Among Jews here and in Israel, 
there has been a feeling of abandonment. The West's call for a peaceful resolution of the situation, an immediate ceasefire, which began as soon as the war started, have been seen as a de facto siding with Hamas and the Palestinians. It's as though the pain and horror of the initial slaughter of civilians was somehow neutralized in the world's eyes as soon as an equal number of Palestinians had been killed, and everything after that was simply overkill and cruelty. On this day, when we use the phrase, lest we forget, we should also recall the Jewish version of that phrase, which is, never again. That phrase is meant to remind us the Jewish people should never be subject to genocide again. The Nazi attempt to extinguish the Jewish people should never be allowed to happen again, and all steps in that direction should be stopped. For centuries, the Jewish people in the West have been seen as second-class citizens. And we Christians can take a lot of blame for that. Christians have marked them as people who rejected Christ and who even contributed to his death. This is a lie. He was killed by the Roman Empire at the prompting of a few temple officials who would not in their time even have been considered legitimate representatives of the Jewish people. But this lie lives on even today in some circles. Jews throughout European history have been subject to attacks for simply existing, even with entire communities wiped out in pogroms. This culminated in the Nazi concentration camps with an explicit attempt to destroy all Jews. The shock and horror of this genocidal attempt led to the creation of the modern state of Israel as a refuge, a place where Jews could finally be safe and call home. The attack by Hamas that killed 1,400 civilians and soldiers was the worst single attack since the days of the Nazi concentration camps. Hamas's mandate stated in their own manifestos, is to destroy the state of Israel. It simply should not exist. Their animosity against all Jews is cited directly in their founding statements. To Jews, the attack by Hamas is the latest in a long line of efforts to eliminate the Jewish people simply for being Jews. If never again is to have any meaning then Israel and many Jewish people feel that the state has every right to strike back against this genocidal attack. But how much is enough? From a Christian perspective, the answer is simple. No innocent lives should be lost to achieve a military objective. No Jewish or Palestinian children or non-soldiers should be killed. No civilians of any kind should be killed. If you want to have a war, set a date and fight it out on a battlefield. We should recall that Hamas hides behind civilians, using them as human shields. Their stated disregard for Jewish life extends to their own people, too. This is often the way. Those who treat human life with disregard among the enemy are often ready to do the same to their own. On this day of remembering, we need to recall what we knew in the days immediately before the attacks. That this situation is complex. That Israel's government was led by a coalition of far-right parties who wanted to take back the occupied territories. This government had rejected previous peace accords and proposals for a two-state solution. We need to remember that the Prime Minister was up on multiple charges of corruption. 
this same government was actively trying to reduce the power of the Supreme Court and was widely regarded by Israelis as an enemy of democracy. Huge protests were waged in the weeks before the attack against the government. On this day of remembering, we should also recall that Hamas won power in a civil war in 2007 and has never allowed elections since. They are the dictators of the Gaza Strip and have no interest in democracy or peaceful solutions. Neither government wanted to foster peace or democracy. This was plain the day before the war began, and we should not forget it now. When governments lose interest in peace and the interests of their own people, we should not be surprised that tragedy follows. In today's psalm, the writer cries out against the ungodly who surround them. They yearn to be in God's presence again at the holy temple where there is joy and safety. The psalmist calls for God's light and God's truth. The God who this person worships is not a God who delights in war, but one who calls for God's people to always take care of the stranger in their midst, to treat the foreigner and non-Jewish people with equal consideration. They are to be protected and treated as equals. In the book of Deuteronomy, God states, For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who is not partial and takes no bribes, who executes justice for the orphan and the widow, and who loves the strangers, providing them with food and clothing. You also should love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Israel. They have the land of Egypt, excuse me. In this time of forgetting and oversimplification, let us remember that the state of Israel is not just a home to Jews. Within Israel, not counting the occupied territories, almost one quarter of the population are Arabs with citizenship. Among the seven million Jews in Israel, a little over half are secular and are not religiously observant. When Hamas attacks Israel as a Jewish state, it ignores the large proportion of Israeli citizens who are secular and Muslim. Indeed, when Hamas launched its attack, it attacked not only Jews, but also Arab Bedouin, who are Muslims. Hamas wants to destroy the country of Israel and wants the world to forget that Israel is a pluralistic society. Hamas doesn't want Jews and Muslims and secular people living together peacefully. Hamas wants a Muslim-only state and for the Jews to simply be pushed off and disappear. As Christians, we live in Israel every Sunday. We know it as a place where Christianity was born. It's a place where Jesus moved among pagans and Jews alike, offering healing to them both. Jesus frequently quotes from the Hebrew Scriptures, especially the prophecy of Isaiah. In that Scripture, God offers love not just to the Jewish people, to the people of all nations. God offers us the dream of swords being turned into plowshares, of implements of death becoming tools that can foster fertility and life and feed people. God's vision for us humans is peaceful coexistence. It is this divine power hungry to see peace on earth, which Kipling's poem begs us to remember. 
lest we forget that we are not self-made, but God's people, a people called to peace. The current war is being waged by two governments who have shown little interest in negotiating a way to living in peaceful coexistence. These governments have both been enemies of democracy and do not adequately represent their people. This is a war between governments, not a war between peoples or religions. Our God, the God of Christians, Jews, and Muslims, and everyone else, calls for peace among all peoples. Our God will be more impressed by a Jerusalem shared by people of multiple faiths than one surrounded by barbed wire with just one faith in charge. To do that would require a significant change of heart, away from pride. In Kipling's words, still stands thine ancient sacrifice, an humble and contrite heart. Lord God of hosts, be with us yet, lest we forget, lest we forget. Amen.